the most epic story. To end all cheating stories. Trust me, relax and stick till the end and find out why this story will be absolutely triggering to cheaters. Before we start, read the 329 pages of the like button's terms and conditions, but click disagree. I thought the day couldn't possibly worsen, but I was mistaken. The entire week at work had been dreadful, and to top it off, my boss, the company president, called me into his office to reprimand me for a mistake made by someone else. Upon arriving home, I discovered my sister-in-law's car blocking my driveway, preventing me from parking in front of my house. The neighbor's teenage son and his friends had filled the street with parked cars, forcing me to park three doors down. Before parking, I questioned why I bothered. My relationship with my wife's sister Susan had always been strained since the day we met. I couldn't fathom why, but she seemed to harbour a deep dislike for me. Furthermore, I had little hope for an intimate evening with my wife Maya, as we hadn't been intimate in almost a month, despite for my lack of trying. Walking towards my house, I noticed an empty garbage can by the curb and dragged it around the side of the house through the side gate, placing it next to the back door. Entering the kitchen, I heard music and the chatter of my wife and her sister in the living room. Grabbing a beer from the refrigerator, I took a sip before heading towards the living room. However, a sentence I'd overheard at the door froze me in my tracks. God... He d***ed me three times already today. It didn't come from my sister-in-law, but from my beloved wife. She continued, Ever since Tanner came back last month, I just can't get enough of him. My wife confessed. I knew Tanner as my wife's ex-boyfriend, who had left her and moved away. Curious, my wife's sister asked, So what are you going to do now? Maya replied, Tanner wants me to move in with him, so I'll get a lawyer and file for divorce. We have no prenup, so I'll get half of everything. I had heard more than enough already. Silently, I made my way to the back door and retraced my steps to my car. Opening the door, I sank into the driver's seat, now realizing the reason I had been denied any intimacy or love. My wife was sharing it with someone else, and now she's scheming to take half of everything. The worst part was that the state was likely to grant it to her. Maya and I had tied the knot just three years ago. She had quit her job right after our vows, and when she was at home, she never lifted a finger. I hired a maid three times a week for house cleaning and laundry, and on those days, she would cook dinner. The rest of the time, either I cooked or she ordered takeout. I know what you might be thinking, but love had me hypnotized. She kept me happy, and we had a great bed life until a month ago. My mother passed away when I was 13, a devastating loss for both my father and me. Dad did his best to raise me right, and we became very close. Losing him to a drunk driver when I was 23 was a significant blow, occurring just a year before I met Maya. Inheriting nearly $2.5 million from Dad, I wisely kept the money invested with the guidance of a good broker. Despite Maya's attempts to spend every dime I earned, I had another hundreds of thousands in savings. I had never touched the inheritance, making it grow even in the current economy. I had enough to live comfortably, and I didn't have to spend it. My trust in and love for Maya led us to skip a prenuptial agreement. A dumb mistake many make, thinking their marriage will last forever. This oversight meant she could potentially take almost a million and a half from me, all for the privilege of letting me have the sugar walls. The state seemed all too willing to support this legalized form of exploitation. She had mentioned getting a lawyer, indicating she wasn't yet prepared to serve me. I knew I had little time to act. I got it all before we were married, though, so technically she couldn't grab it all? But it's clear she's willing to put up a boss fight. Formulating a plan, I sat in my car, 
keeping an eye on the rear view mirror until I saw my sister-in-law's car pull out and drive away. I started the car, made a U-turn and walked back to my driveway. Upon entering the house, Maya was nowhere to be seen, so I headed to the kitchen for another beer, popping the top and taking a long sip as I contemplated my next steps. Oh, there you are, honey. Maya greeted, entering the kitchen. I didn't hear you come in. Hey, babe, I just got in. Been a long, rough day. I replied with a loving smile, determined to play the role as convincingly as she did. I didn't have time to order anything for dinner, she said annoyed, as if it was unplanned. Although I wanted to say, that's because you spent your day with your boyfriend, sharing all the details with your sister. But what I uttered was, that's okay, sweetie, I'll just heat up some leftovers from last night. She gave me a sweet smile, kissed my cheek, and announced she was going to go upstairs and relax in a hot bath. Smiling and nodding, I thought, yeah, got to wash all that filth away. When she left, I grabbed a plate of fried rice and ate it cold while downing two more beers. After tossing the empty container, I retreated to the den and settled into my chair. Channel surfing, I settled on an old movie. When Maya returned about an hour later, she sat on the couch until the movie ended. Standing up, she claimed she was tired and heading to bed. Yeah, tired. Tired from being unfaithful. I told her I would watch the news and join her later. I hadn't really paid attention to the movie. My mind was occupied with plotting my next move. Knowing I couldn't do much until Monday, I endured the next few days working in the yard on Saturday and playing golf with buddies on Sunday. On Monday, I called my broker handling my inheritance portfolio and had everything liquidated. Being in an upper management position allowed me to cash in my 401k swiftly. Penalty be damned. By Thursday, I was ready to make my move. Returning home to my supposedly loving wife, I informed her of an emergency situation, explaining that I would be flying out for a week on company business. I packed two suitcases. That was all I needed. When we moved into this house, I had stored everything important to me. None of it fit with her taste, so there was nothing else I wanted to keep. The furnishings were her choices, and frankly, I couldn't care less about them. The silver lining in this situation was that we were renting the house, so I had no financial investment tied up in it. Having recently sold my condo, we were in the process of finding the right house to buy. When I say right, I mean right according to her standards. So far, None of the houses we had looked at seemed to meet her strict criteria. On a Friday morning, I kissed my wife on the cheek one last time and carried my suitcases out the door. Loading them into my SUV, I drove away without a single backward glance. My first stop was at the place of an old buddy, Jimmy, whom I trusted completely. He was perplexed when I proposed trading titles for his older but rebuilt four-wheel drive vehicle. After confiding in him about my situation, I found myself heading west an hour later. I doubted anyone would connect me to this vehicle, and Jimmy promised to keep the car I traded him hidden in the garage for a while. For the next four days, I paid for everything in cash. I had cancelled all our credit cards to avoid leaving a paper trail. The majority of my money was now safely tucked away in an offshore account, thanks to my broker. I had a system in place with him to arrange fund transfers when needed. I had enough cash hidden in the car to last for a while. The nights alone in motels were the toughest. For the past week, I had been too occupied with executing my plan to reflect on what had happened to me personally. I had loved Maya. I really did with all I had. I wouldn't have married her if I hadn't. I played through various what-if scenarios in my mind, but ultimately, I concluded that there wasn't much I could have done differently. Even if I had known her old boyfriend had returned, I doubted I could have kept them apart. I arrived at two conclusions. She probably never truly loved me, and it was my own fault for being foolish enough to marry her. On the fifth day away from home, I found myself sitting in a mom-and-pop diner in a small town in Montana. 
I pondered what my supposedly loving wife was up to, as by now she must have discovered that all her credit cards were cancelled and our bank account held no money. My thoughts were interrupted by an older couple at the next table, whose quiet conversation I couldn't help but overhear. The man, who appeared to be in his late fifties, was telling his red-haired wife about his wish for an extra hand on their farm. Unfortunately, they couldn't afford to hire anyone until their current calves were ready for the market. Even then, finding someone willing to work for what they could pay proved to be a challenge. Finishing the last bite of my meal, I stood up and approached their table, expressing my apologies for eavesdropping, but suggesting I might be able to help them. The older man scrutinized me, sizing me up. I don't see how you could do that. If you heard what we were talking about, you know I can't pay you anything. What if I just need a place to stay in exchange for my labor, I proposed. His eyes narrowed. Ellie, excuse us for a moment while I speak to this young man outside, he said to his wife. Standing up, he waited for me to follow him. Once in the parking lot, where our conversation would remain private, he turned to face me. I estimated him to be about my height, six feet, with broad shoulders and not an ounce of fat. His once dark hair was mostly grey, and his face showed the rugged lines of years spent working outdoors. Who the hell are you? Are you part of that Wilson ranch? He asked with a hint of suspicion. I raised my hands defensively and said, Hold on there, mister. I don't know anything about any Wilson. Four days ago, I was living in Texas, and I just arrived here this morning. I thought maybe we could help each other out. He replied, If what you say is true, why would you want to help us out? I can't afford to pay you. What's in it for you? If you're on the run from the law, we don't need that kind of trouble. I said, I'm probably on the run, as you put it, but not like you may think. I proceeded to share my story about my unfaithful wife, planning to take me to the cleaners and how I could use a place to stay for a while. I haven't robbed anybody. I'm just trying to keep what's rightfully mine. I told him that if he has a place I could stay, I'll repay him with my labor. I'll pay my own way, and if you don't think I'm any help, tell me, and I'll be on my way with no hard feelings. He studied my face and said, Son, if what you're telling me is the truth, I think I'd be a fool not to at least give you a shot. I have to tell you up front, though. The Wilsons are trying to get me to sell my land to them. They haven't done anything underhanded yet, but I wouldn't put it past them. You might be biting off more than you can chew. I'd informed him that it was a risk I was willing to take. He then inquired about my ranching experience, and I was honest admitting that I had spent a few summers on my uncle's place in Texas, but I wasn't a cowboy. He extended his hand and we shook on our agreement. He suggested I call him by his first name, Bill, and I introduced myself. We walked back into the diner where Ellie awaited. He called out to her, Ellie, this is Tom. He's going to be working for us if he can handle it. She stood and extended her hand. I shook it and she greeted me warmly. It's very nice to meet you, Tom. Her voice held a clear tone, with perhaps a hint of an Irish accent. Like her husband, she was trim and fit, and I said, It's nice to meet you too, ma'am. She responded, The last name is Anderson, but you just call me Ellie. Don't really have much use for formality in this part of the country. I instantly liked this gracious lady. Bill suggested we head back to the ranch. Before leaving town, he pulled up to a general store, and we both stepped out of our vehicles. He told me I might want to pick up some clothes suitable for ranch work. Entering the store, he received a warm greeting from the owner, clearly a regular customer. Forty minutes later, I had enough jeans, work shirts, a coat and a pair of western-style riding boots for a week. It was sufficient, for the time being. From the general store, it was about a twenty-mile drive to the main gate, arched with the name Rocking Bee Ranch. That was Bill's brand name, Rocking Bee. Another mile of a private road led to the main house. Perched on a rise, their two-story house looked well-maintained and freshly painted. Behind it, a barn and several outbuildings came into view. The pickup they drove was partly loaded with sacks of groceries, indicating their weekly trip into town for supplies. I pulled up behind them, 
filled my arms with bags and followed the Andersons into the kitchen. In two trips, we had the truck unloaded. Bill instructed me to drive around back, where he showed me a small cabin for my stay. As I pulled around, I saw him standing in front of the cabin. When I got out, he pointed to the cabin and mentioned that Kent used a similar one a few yards away, adding that Kent was out making the rounds and I would meet him later. After unloading my bags, he waited while I settled into the cabin. It had a single large room with a bed along one wall, a table with two chairs, a potbelly wood stove in one corner, and a bathroom with a single store shower. It wasn't luxurious, but it was clean and served as a suitable place to stay for now, at least allowing me to hopefully avoid being found by Maya. When I returned outside, he was sitting in his pickup and told me to hop in. He took me on a tour of the ranch which covered almost 6,000 acres. 5,000 acres were relatively flat and suitable for grazing, with a couple of hundred acres set aside for growing winter feed. The back section of the ranch, hilly and covered in forest, led to mountains with a stream flowing through the property, accessible only on horseback. He shared that he used to have three full-time hands, but Kent was the only one left after tough times. Kent had been working on the ranch for nearly 30 years. During roundups for selecting stock to take to market, they hired extra help. He dropped me off at the little cabin around five o'clock. He mentioned that he noticed I carried a laptop. He then told me he has a satellite connection with a router, so I can access the internet wirelessly. Also, that supper is in the main house, and we normally eat at six, he mentioned before driving away. In less than 30 minutes, I had settled in, leaving me time to boot up my computer. As he had mentioned, I was able to make a wireless connection, and I quickly checked for email. There was one message from Jimmy, stating that Maya had reported me missing to the police, and they were investigating my disappearance. It gave me something to ponder. Jimmy was the only one I had actually told about leaving, and even he didn't know where I was going. I had mailed my resignation to my former employer, but hadn't informed them in person about my departure. Just before six, I walked over to the main house and knocked on the door. Bill called for me to come in, and as I stepped inside, I saw Ellie preparing food while Bill stood to the side, talking to a man I assumed was Kent. Bill motioned me over. Kent, this is Tom, the new hand I mentioned, at least for today. We'll see how he feels about it tomorrow after a day's work. Tom, meet Kent. Bill said with a broad grin. Kent gave me a warm smile and extended his hand. A big man, at least six foot three. He, like Bill, appeared to have worked hard throughout his life and seemed around the same age as Bill. One notable detail, he was African American. I shook his hand, sensing the strength in his grip. Well, young man, let's hope you'll like it here. I could use the help, he said. At 28, I was about half his age, so he considered me young. I replied, I plan to give it my best shot. Just then, Ellie called us to sit down as supper was ready. Bill and his wife sat at opposite ends of the table, leaving Kent and me to sit between them across from each other. On the table were a large platter of pork chops, a big bowl of mashed potatoes, another with fresh green beans, and a plate stacked with obviously homemade biscuits. We don't eat fancy here, Tom. But there's plenty, and it's filling, Ellie said. It looks great, I replied. As we ate, I asked Bill if he had been here all his life, and his response was, Yep, my grandfather started this ranch and passed it on to my father. Now it belongs to me and Ellie. Although when I was younger, I wasn't so sure she was going to be a part of it. I had to fight off every man to get her. He looked at his wife and I could see the depth of his love for her in his eyes. She responded, Now, Bill, you know you're the only man I ever had eyes for. I just had to make sure that you wanted me enough. Bill followed. My wife has been responsible for the three happiest days of my life. The day she agreed to marry me, the day she did marry me, and the day she gave birth to our daughter, Brooke. I hadn't seen any sign of a daughter, and Ellie must have noticed my curious look and added that their daughter is away right now. She's finishing her doctorate's degree in veterinary sciences at South Dakota State University. She's only been able to be home for the holidays, and we are anxiously waiting for her to come back home with her degree. 
She's supposed to be home in a couple of months. Bill added, It'll be nice to have a vet in the family. Should cut down on some of the expenses. After dinner, I attempted to help clear the dishes, but Ellie insisted that it was her job and shooed me away. Bill mentioned that breakfast was at 5.30 and work would start at 6. As Kent and I were leaving, I noticed a copy of today's New York Times on the counter. I asked if I could borrow the front page and he agreed. Once outside, I asked him to step into my cabin for a moment. Inside, I took out my digital camera and showed him how to use it. I had him take a close-up of me holding up the front page of the newspaper. I could tell he was curious, but he didn't ask. He did ask if I had an alarm clock, and I assured him I had one. He said he would see me in the morning and left. I downloaded the picture to my computer and drafted it into an email along with a note to the police in my former hometown. The message stated that I was alive and well, and I had left town of my own free will. Choosing a national newspaper instead of a local one kept my location ambiguous. I sent the email to Jimmy and instructed him to use one of the local coffee shops with free internet access, as my working email would likely still be active. I provided my password so he could forward the original email and picture to the authorities, without leaving any traceable paths for a detective working for Maya. This way, I wanted to make sure to avoid being listed on any FBI or national missing person lists, assuming the authorities would know all is good and won't allocate extensive resources to search for a runaway husband. I slept soundly that night. The next morning, I was up at five, showered and dressed in time to walk with Kent to the main house. After eating, Bill instructed Kent to put me to work replacing fence posts in the hilly section. Following Kent to the barn, he pointed out a horse and saddle I would need. He seemed satisfied with the way I saddled the big brown mare, drawing on my experience from my uncle's ranch. We then took two mules, attaching saddle packs to load fence posts and a post hole there. Bill joined us at the barn, carrying a Winchester Model 94 in a saddle scabbard, explaining it was mainly for the rare occasion when we might need to put down a sick cow. Mounted up and leading a mule each, Kent and I headed out, following the creek up into the hills. As Kent and I rode, we engaged in conversation and got to know each other. I shared the story of how I ended up in Montana, trusting that he wouldn't betray my trust. In return, he recounted his own experiences. He'd married right after high school, only to discover his ex-wife in bed with another man. In a fit of rage, he fought the guy, resulting in a five-year prison sentence. Upon his release, Bill was the only one willing to give him a chance, and that was how he had spent the last 30 years here. Kent spoke highly of Bill and Ellie, considering them to be the salt of the earth. Half an hour later, we reached the fence, marking the property boundaries. Kent pointed out that not all the posts needed replacement, only those that had rotted or were close to it, approximately every third one. He stayed with me while I replaced the first two to ensure I was doing it correctly. He suggested working until around four, allowing me enough time to return, care for the horse and mules, and make it to dinner at six. His parting advice was to follow the stream back down, ensuring I wouldn't get lost. He headed back, leaving me alone with my work. I progressed down the line, replacing old posts with new ones. At noon, I took a break and retrieved the pork chop sandwiches that Ellie had given me in the morning from my saddlebag. I finished my sandwiches and returned to work. My watch's alarm beat at four in the afternoon. I noticed that I had set all but a couple of the posts that the mules had carried up. Leading the mules, I traced back along the fence line until I found the stream and began descending. Just before leaving the trees, I discovered a natural pool where the stream flowed in and out. I stopped and admired the view, recognizing it as the most beautiful and serene spot on the ranch. Back at the barn, I managed to unsaddle the animals and get them fed in time. While I was tending to the horses, Kent entered to bed down his horse. We rushed to wash up and change before supper where we enjoyed steaks that night. Exhausted, I made minimal contributions to the conversation and excused myself immediately after dinner to go to bed. Sleep came quickly, 
and I slept deeply. When I woke up, I was sore all over. My hands ached from wielding the post hole digger, and my arms, shoulders, and legs throbbed. Despite my regular workouts, there was a vast difference between a two-hour gym session and a full day of setting fence posts. As I limped into the kitchen and winced while sitting down, I received a couple of chuckles from Bill and Kent. Even Ellie couldn't completely hide her grin. However, despite the soreness, I was energetic and eagerly devoured my breakfast. Ready for another day of fencing? Bill asked as we rose from the table. I groaned and replied, yes sir, hoping to sound more optimistic than I felt. Bill laughed. I think you can give it a rest today. I'd like for you to ride the rounds with Kent. I nodded appreciatively. The first task was to clean the stalls and replace the hay. After putting the horses and mules in the pasture and filling their feeder, we loaded up in the pickup and began our ranch inspection. Our primary goal was to ensure no cows were down or separated from their mothers. Kent's knowledge of the ranch seemed instinctual, and he effortlessly anticipated where the cattle would be and roughly estimated their numbers. After 30 years, it seemed to come naturally to him. As we reached the far end of the ranch, Kent stopped the truck and surveyed the surroundings. Something on one of the hills caught his attention, prompting him to hand me his binoculars and point to a specific spot. After a minute, I identified two cows seemingly alone. I'd inquired where their mothers are, and he gestured towards two cows near the tree line. I see them. Their cows must have wandered into the trees, got lost, and kept going. We'll have to bring them down. I asked. Are we hiking up there? Nah, it's too far. We'll go back and load up a couple of horses. The pickups were equipped with two-way radios, and Kent called Bill, informing him of what we had seen and that we were on our way to get the horses. When we returned to the barn, Bill had already saddled two horses and loaded them into a trailer. All we had to do was stock up and go. Kent navigated us close to the tree line below where the calves were, and we unloaded the horses riding up into the hills. Kent's 30 years on the ranch became evident once again, as he knew the terrain like the back of his hand. Half an hour later, we eased up behind the calves and slowly began to push them back down the hills. I couldn't help but laugh when we cleared the trees, and the wayward juveniles spotted their mothers. They ran, howling to their moms, and immediately sought out a tit to nurse on. The larger cows stood patiently, allowing their young to feed. It struck me how different it was from my childhood. That night's supper featured fried chicken, corn on the cob, and mashed potatoes. With newfound energy, I talked more than the night before and learned more about Ellie. Her parents had immigrated to the United States from Ireland when she was five years old. Her father, fascinated by tales of the Old West, had brought the family to Montana, explaining the trace of Irish in her speech. Growing up in America, she still retained the influence of her parents. Feeling much better the next day, I returned to replace fence posts after breakfast. Kent helped me load up the mules, but this time I headed out on my own. Following the stream led me directly to my destination. This day proved to be easier than the first, as I'd learned some tricks to make the work less strenuous. Just before four o'clock, I set the last post and headed back to the barn. With some extra time, I worked some of the stalls before cleaning up for dinner. On my fourth day, I assisted Kent in making repairs to some of the buildings, and the following day, I set more fence posts. The next two months flew by, and I now took my turn riding the ranch to check on the cattle. I was in the best shape of my life. We established a schedule where Kent took Saturdays off, Bill took off Sundays, and Mondays were my days off. I used my day to do laundry and run into town if needed. I had grown quite fond of everyone on the ranch. Kent was good-natured and easygoing, and we often sat and talked after supper. I had a lot of respect for Bill, honest and hard-working. We got along well. Ellie was very sweet to Kent and me, but I could see she had some fire in her. Together, she and Bill made a great couple. Ellie and Bill were growing excited. At breakfast on Friday, Ellie informed me that her daughter would be returning home in one week. It was my turn that day to take a horse and ride through the wooded section, checking for cattle that might have wandered into the hills. 
A little after four, I made my way to the stream, turned to follow it down, and reached the pool below the waterfall. I stopped, dismounted, took off my shirt, and knelt down next to the water. Dipping my bandana into the fresh water, I began to wash the sweat and dust from my face and neck. A witty from downstream caught my attention, and I looked to my right, to see a horse and rider approaching. At first, I thought it was Ellie, but quickly realized this was a younger version of her. This pretty woman could only be Brooke, with the crystal blue eyes and red hair like her mother. She rode up and stopped several feet from me as I stood up and faced her. She asked in a cold tone, Who are you, and what are you doing on this property? I said, The names Tom and I work here. She said, I don't believe you. My dad said he couldn't afford to pay another hand. Despite her beauty, I was getting a little aggravated at her unfriendly tone and said, Yeah, I heard that too. I guess that's why I laugh all the way to the bank every payday. She gazed at me, turned her horse around, and gave it a kick in the sides. I chuckled to myself, put my shirt back on, remounted my horse, and continued towards the barn. Later, I found out there had been miscommunication between Brooke and her parents. They thought she was coming home the next week. Instead, much to their surprise, she had arrived a couple of hours after I had ridden out. She had spent the morning and the early part of the afternoon with her parents until she desired to go for a ride, something she hadn't had time for in school, but loved to do. So she saddled up and rode to her favorite spot, the waterfall and pool of water. I guess, after two months, I was old news and Bill and Ellie had forgotten to mention me. Just as I returned to the barn, I saw the back of the redhead disappear inside. I dismounted and proceeded to leave my horse inside. Brooke must have been looking for her father, and finally found him in the barn. I could clearly hear her loud voice as she asked, Who is that man that was up at the waterfall? Bill thought for a minute and said, That must have been Tom. She added, He said, He works here, but last time I was here, you told me you couldn't afford to pay another hand. Bill followed. Well, he's right. He does work here. As for what he gets paid, I don't think that's any of your business. I still run this ranch, young lady. She sputtered. But he said you pay him so much that he laughs all the way to the bank. By that point, I had walked into the barn. She had her back to me and didn't see me, but Bill did. He gave me a grin and said, Is that true, Tom? If you think you're overpaid, I can rectify that. She spun around and locked me in her eyes. I pulled my hat off with one hand and scratched the back of my head with the other and said, Well, I would hate to take advantage of you, Bill. Just how much are you thinking of cutting my wages? At that, Bill and I both cracked up laughing. She just continued to glare at both of us, failing to see the humor. Sweetheart, just so you get that bee out of your bonnet, Tom gets to stay in the cabin, next to Kent's. Bill said. She responded. And what else? So you're saying you aren't paying him? Why would he work for nothing? Bill responded. That and he gets to eat your mother's fine cooking. He has his reasons, and it's not my place to tell you. I then chipped in. Working to have a chance to taste your mother's cooking is worth a lot, and I don't think she would like to hear you say that it's nothing. She shot me one more glare and stormed out of the barn. Bill shook his head and said, She reminds me so much of her mother. When she was young, I didn't think I would ever take Ellie. At supper that night, we were joined by Brooke. She sat next to Kent, on the opposite side of the table from me. She gave me another sharp look when I entered the kitchen. I waited until everyone had filled their plates before speaking. I said in a pleasant voice, Your mother tells me that you have finished your doctorate in veterinary medicine. Yeah was her one-word answer given without looking up. I continued, Kent says that there is only one other vet in the area, and he's over 30 miles away. I'm sure you're going to be a very big asset to the folks in this area. She glanced up at my compliment, and I thought I saw her eyes soften a bit. Yes, that would be Dr. Harrison. He has more business than he can handle and is often needed in more than one place at the same time. Ellie then added, I agree with you, Tom. Our Brooke will be able to provide a great service. 
During the rest of the meal, Brooke talked with her parents and Kent, who had been on the ranch since before she was born. She didn't address me directly, and I, for the most part, kept quiet. This was her homecoming, and I knew her parents and Kent wanted to hear what had been happening in her life while she was away. As soon as I finished eating, I excused myself to turn in. I returned to my cabin and checked my email, seeing that I had one from Jimmy. He reported that he had talked to a friend of his on the force and casually asked if they still considered me to be a missing person. His friend said that everything had been dropped after they received the email with the picture I had sent them. As for Maya, Tanner had apparently dumped her as soon as he learned I had disappeared with all the money, and it didn't look like Maya was going to get her hands on any of it soon. Of course, she couldn't afford the rent on the house we had been living in, and was now living in a city apartment, working as a waitress. She didn't have the money to hire a lawyer to pursue me. I thought it was ironic. She had apparently only married me for my money, and her boyfriend had only wanted her for the same thing, my money. I was still working on replacing fence posts. I now only did so every third or fourth day. I had moved out of the hill and was down where I could drive the pickup to where I worked. It really was easier to load the posts in the back of the truck rather than on the mules. The morning after Brooke returned home, I loaded the pickup with posts and drove to where I had left off. When it was my normal time to have lunch, I started to head back to the truck and realized that I hadn't brought my lunch with me. If any of us were going to be working away from the main house all day, Ellie would make sure we had lunch, and I guess I forgot picking mine up. I could have driven back to the house, but decided that missing one meal wasn't going to hurt me. About a half hour later, I just set a pole and was attaching the wire when I heard a vehicle approaching. I looked back and saw it was one of the ranch trucks. The truck came to a stop just as I finished with that post. I turned around and was surprised to see Brooke get out. She had a small sack in her hand like the ones Ellie put our lunches in. Mama said you forgot your lunch, she said, shoving the bag towards me. I reached out and took it from her. Thank you, Brooke. That's very kind of you, I replied. I looked in the bag and saw it contained two sandwiches as usual. I took one out and offered the other to her, but she shook her head. I shrugged my shoulders and went and sat on the tailgate of the truck to eat. She walked over to where I was, about five feet to my side, and just stared at me. I just sat and ate, keeping my eyes focused in front of me. I could feel her staring. Why are you here? I turned and looked at her and decided to mess with her. I said, you can't tell anybody. I robbed a bank and stashed the money. I'm hiding out here until the heat is off and I can retrieve the cash. At first, her eyes grew wide. Then she glared at me. You're a real clown. She huffed and turned to leave. I waited until she was halfway to her truck. Then I called her. She heard me say her name and stopped and slowly turned around. I said, I married a woman who never loved me and only wanted the things I could provide for her. I ended up here because I just wanted to get away from everything I knew for a while. She again stared at me, and I think she decided I was telling the truth this time. She nodded her head and left without another word. As she drove away, I thought about what her dad had said about her mother being like her, when she was that age. He said he had tamed her, but I suspect it was their love for each other that was the secret. It had been less than 24 hours since I first met Brooke, and I couldn't imagine any man taming the fiery redhead. Supper that night was pretty much a repeat of the night before, Brooke had conversations with her parents and Kent. I didn't really feel left out, though. After all, she didn't know me, and we had nothing in common, really. We were just finishing dinner when there was a knock on the door, and Bill went to answer it. He came into the kitchen, followed by a man about my age. He was what women would call tall, dark, and handsome. Brooke excitedly called out his name and jumped from her seat and hugged the guy. It was obvious they knew each other. They were going on about how long it had been since they had seen each other. A few minutes later, there was another knock on the door, and Bill went and answered it, and returned with another man. This one was fair-haired, but also good-looking. He received an equally warm greeting from Brooke. I recalled Bill's words. 
about having to fend off every male around to win his wife. Brooke was every bit the prize that her mother was, at least in looks. I excused myself from the table and returned to my cabin. Mentally, I wished the two guys luck. I did envy them, though. If Brooke turned out to be the woman her mother was, whoever won her affections would be a lucky man. The next day, I took the pickup and rode the ranch. By the time I had made my rounds, something didn't seem to add up. It was early enough that I went back and got Kent, and we did a whirlwind search of the ranch. There were a lot of cattle scattered over the ranch, but he agreed that something didn't feel right. It just seemed like we were short a few herds. We decided we would saddle up the next day and ride the hilly areas. We discussed it with Bill that night at supper, and he agreed to our plan. It rained that night, which would make finding tracks more difficult. The next morning, we loaded our horses into a trailer, and Bill drove us to one end of the property. I rode about a third of the way up into the tree line, and Kent rode another third higher. We then headed across the ranch over the hills and through the trees. It took a big part of the day to reach the far side. We counted five stray herd. Bill met us as we came out of the hills, and we loaded the horses in the trailer and headed back. We discussed the situation and decided the only thing we could do is be more vigilant. At dinner that night, Brooke had another admirer call on her. I heard her mother mutter something about that being the third one that day. The word had gotten out that she was back home, and guys were crawling out of the woodwork, seeking her attention. The next four days, we spent a lot of time keeping an eye on the herd. Everything seemed to be okay, except for the suspected original loss. Brooke's friendly orbiters continued to visit. She had been home for a week and hadn't said two words to me since the day she brought me my lunch. The fifth day after the perceived disappearance of the cattle, I told Bill I wanted to ride the property line through the hills. We had already covered all the fence lines along the pasture areas and had seen no evidence that the missing cattle had taken through there. Kent dropped me off on the west side of the ranch. This was where Bill's ranch bordered the Wilson Ranch. About halfway to the southwest corner, I spotted three fresh sets of horse tracks. They crossed from the Wilson side of the fence to our side. The puzzling thing is that the fence wire was still up. I dismounted and checked the fence posts and saw that the staples had been loosened on five posts and were barely holding the wire up. Remove the staples and lower the wire and you could cross over easily. Put the wire and staples back and it looked normal. I remounted and followed the tracks. When I got near the stream, I saw three horses tied to a tree a little way above the waterfall. I was still about 30 yards away and I quickly got down, tied my horse to a tree and pulled the rifle from the scabbard. When I reached the horses, I could see boot prints leading downstream. I crept to the edge of the waterfall and looked over and gasped. There was Brooke in the pool. She was naked as the day she was born. I was mesmerized by the sight. She was swimming through the water, her body clearly on display in the clear water. For a moment, it grabbed my attention. Then my attention gets pulled towards movement in the trees to her right, which instantly brought me back to my senses. I quickly scanned the area and saw one guy to the right and two more nearing the pond on the left. I raised my rifle and shot. The bullet hit near the feet of the guy on the right. One more quick pull of the trigger and the dirt exploded close to the two guys on the left. Brooke released a blood-curling scream that echoed through the trees. I stood up so everyone could see me and I yelled out, On your bellies now! I won't miss next shot! Brooke, stay where you are! She didn't see the three men. She only saw me standing near her with a rifle in my hands and she struggled to cover her body. One of the men on the left flinched as if he was going to run, but the bark on the tree right next to him exploded as I pulled the trigger again, and he was convinced and dropped flat down. Brooke looked to where I had shot and saw the two men. She shrieked again. I started to count down, and before I could count to one, the other two dropped down. I immediately instructed them to put their hands behind their heads, and they again did as ordered. I quickly instructed Brooke to get out and get dressed. She tried to protest, but I growled at her to just do as I say, 
to get dressed and get out of there. She was clearly scared, and I could see her shaking from where I was. But she did as I ordered and walked out of the pool. Like Venus rising from the sea, she stepped out of the water. Even though she kept her back to me, I couldn't take my eyes off her. The sight of her alabaster skin glowing and the perfectly rounded figure were forever etched into my mind. She only put on her jeans and shirt and swung up onto her horse. One kick and she was gone through the trees. When she was gone, I ordered the men one by one to get up on the dirt and lie back down. Only when all three lay before me did I breathe a sigh of relief. I decided it was time for a bluff. So what am I going to do with you three? I guess I could use some practice. The men began to beg me to spare them. I said, even if I spare you, Brooke's father will ensure justice when I inform him of your heinous intentions toward his daughter. Unless, of course, you have a more compelling confession for the sheriff, something like cattle rustling. It may lead to jail time, but at least it guarantees you a chance at life. The smallest among them cracked. Yes, we did it. Wilson said breaking Anderson would secure his land. His colleague hushed him to shut up, but he retorted, saying he ain't dying for no damn cows. Anticipating Brooke's swift return and her father's inevitable investigation, I opted to buy my time. True to expectation, 45 minutes later, Bill and Kent galloped into view. I signaled them down and they raced up to join me atop the rise. What in the hell is happening? Bill demanded. Brought to you by Royal AI. It appears some of Wilson's hands paid us an unwelcome visit. I tracked them from the fence line to here. Brooke was swimming and these three were attempting to sneak up on her. Walking over, I pressed the barrel of my rifle against the smaller man's neck. I believe this one has something he wants to confess to you. <gasps> Prodding him again, he whimpered that they did it. He confessed they were the ones who took some of Bill's cattle, but it was Wilson who forced them. Bill tilted his hat back, grinning at Kent, and said, You know, when my grandfather ran this ranch, they'd hang horse thieves and cattle rustlers. Sometimes justice seemed simpler back then. Too bad we have to be civilized these days. While Kent stood guard, Bill and I decided to march the rustlers back down. With rifles in hand, we trailed behind them, Kent tethering their horses together and bringing up the rear. Upon reaching the buildings, we led the rustlers into the barn, placing them in separate stalls with open doors that allowed us to keep watch, without them seeing each other. Bill went into the house to call the sheriff, while Kent and I stood guard. In under 30 minutes, the sheriff raced up the lengthy mile-long drive. Bill met him, briefing him on the unfolding events. I proposed bringing the smaller culprit out first for the sheriff to interrogate, and he agreed. I promptly had my prisoner outside. Initially hesitant, the little rustler seemed to reconsider his silence and began to speak. The sheriff looked at Bill and said, it appears that we got a straightforward case of trespassing here. Honestly, it's a bit of a waste of my time, but I suppose I could leave them in your hands. Forget I saw them. I'll let you handle things. The frightened rustler's eyes widened, and he suddenly opened up. The sheriff soon extracted the truth, calling for backup. Soon, a convoy of sheriff vehicles rushed onto Wilson's vast ranch. Despite its extensive area, the sheriff was able to point the exact location provided by the rustler, discovering almost 100 stolen cattle bearing the Rocking Bee brand. By day's end, Wilson and his cohorts were incarcerated. Amidst the commotion, it was well past nine before we gathered for supper. Brooke, though seated at the table, kept her gaze fixed on her plate. What were you doing up there? Bill inquired, addressing her as he hadn't had much chance to speak with her. I was just taking a swim. I didn't think anyone would come spy on me. She cast me an accusing glare. I interjected, Firstly, Brooke, I wasn't spying on you. I traced their horse tracks to the stream. Secondly, consider what might have happened if I hadn't been there. I doubt those three were planning a picnic when they saw you skinny dipping in peace. Ellie remarked, Thank goodness you arrived when you did, Tom. I hate to think what might have happened. 
the conversation shifted and we hurriedly finished our meal, aware of an early start the next day. Exiting the kitchen toward my cabin, Brooke called out to me. Hey, Tom. I halted and waited as she snapped rudely. So did you enjoy the view today? Expecting gratitude proved too optimistic, so I answered, let's just say I'd be dishonest if I claimed it wasn't breathtaking. She huffed and turned on her heels, marching off toward the house. I stood, shaking my head, acknowledging there was something about me that consistently intrigued her. The following day, Bill had to head into town to officially file charges against Wilson. Returning the stolen cattle to their rightful place would take several days, as the prosecutor needed to thoroughly document the case first. Kent and I spent the day refreshing the paint on some of the outbuildings. We had lunch in the kitchen, but Brooke chose not to join us, a decision that suited me just fine. Bill returned in the early afternoon, but waited until dinner to share the developments. He explained that since this wasn't a capital case, Wilson and his accomplices would be released on bail. While he didn't anticipate any further trouble, he cautioned us to remain vigilant. He glanced at his daughter, grinned mischievously and said, If you're planning on another swim anytime soon, maybe you should take Tom along. No, for protection. Her face turned crimson again and she sputtered as she stood and raced to the room. Bill and Kent erupted in laughter and even Ellie couldn't help but giggle. I chuckled along with them. After the laughter subsided, we resumed our meal. Bill continued his good-natured teasing. I really want to thank you, Tom. I really want to thank you, Tom. Wilson could have seriously jeopardized this ranch financially. You're worth every penny. We all shared another round of laughter. Three days later, Bill received the news that he could retrieve his cattle. We loaded three horses into a trailer and drove to Wilson's Flying Doll Ranch, accompanied by a sheriff's escort. Ellie came along to drive the truck and trailer back. Once we unloaded the horses, Bill, Kent and I started pushing the cows back toward his ranch. As we approached the Rocking Bee Ranch, I rode ahead and loosened part of the fence line, allowing the cattle to cross over. After ensuring all the cattle were back to where they belonged, we secured the fencing and rode back to the main house, satisfied with the day's work. Brooke, during this time, had applied for her veterinarian license. As the approval process typically took around 45 days, she could only tend to the animals on her father's ranch for now. I'd spot her around the property, and of course at mealtime. Despite her continued silent treatment, if I managed to catch her eye, I'd offer a big grin and whittle my eyebrows, always enough to make her blush. Two weeks after the waterfall incident, we found ourselves in the barn at the same time and I asked, been enjoying any swims lately? She approached, standing inches away and shot me a glare. Why are you such a pain? I shrugged, grinned and said, why do you keep stinging like a bee? Her right hand aimed for my face, but I reacted fast grabbing her wrist before she could strike. Undeterred, she tried with her left. Yet, I caught that too. I pushed both hands behind her back, pinning them but forcing her physique against mine. Slowly, I lowered my face toward hers. She stared at me but made no effort to break free. I could feel her tension go down, to relax. I then said, if you were mine, I'd put you over my knee. Attempting to pull back, she replied, You wouldn't dare. Suddenly, I released my hold and she tumbled backward, landing on her butt. It's not that I wouldn't dare, I just got rid of a woman who doesn't care about me and I'm not wasting my time on another one. Traditionally, she was the one to storm off, but this time, it was my turn. I left the barn, leaving her sitting on the ground. I didn't see her again until supper Predictably, she didn't speak to me, but I couldn't decipher the look she gave me. Not that I ever claimed to understand women anyway. My marriage to Maya proved that. The following day I was in the barn, tending to the stalls when Bill walked in. Knowing it was his day off on Sunday, I figured he wanted to talk. I wondered if Brooke had informed him of the previous day's incident, and if he'd come to ask me to leave. I stopped my work as he approached. Then he said, 
I heard you and Brooke had a little showdown yesterday. Well, that answered my question of whether Brooke had confided in her father. But I noticed a twinkle in his eyes and I said, Yeah, I suppose you could say that. Probably my fault. He continued, Maybe, maybe not. I think her issue is she doesn't know what to make of you. First, she thought you were here for something, then you became the hero who saved her. And the ranch. What she can't figure out is why you aren't chasing after her like the other local young men. Like her mother at her age, Brooke is used to having boys wrapped around her little finger. She's had a few boyfriends, but none lasted. I didn't think she really respected them. I just hope you don't let her chase you off. In my book, you're welcome here as long as you want. I said, thanks, Bill. That means a lot to me. For Brooke, I'll quit teasing her, so hopefully we can live and let live. He left the barn, and I resumed my work. I had the rest of the day to ponder Bill's words. If Brooke wanted to understand me, acting civil and having a conversation would be more effective than her current approach. As for pursuing her, like the others, that simply wasn't in the cards. She didn't join us for supper that night, a topic no one mentioned, and I didn't ask. The following day, I stuck to my routine, waking up at five as usual, even on my day off. Breakfast done. After Kent and Bill left for work, I retrieved my laundry. Bill had invested in a large commercial washer and dryer, making it possible for me to wash all my clothes in a single load. The laundry room was adjacent to the kitchen, so while my clothes washed, I sat at the kitchen table, eating and chatting with Ellie. Brooke entered, an uncommon occurrence for breakfast, usually opting to eat later. Ellie asked about my plans for the day, and I told her I was thinking of driving into town. I then asked if there was anything she wanted me to get for her. She said if I wouldn't mind, there are a couple of things I could get for her. I'd assured her I wouldn't mind at all. Just then, Brooke interjected. Could I ride into town with you? I was planning to go to the general store for a few things, and it seems like a waste of gas for both of us to drive separately. I looked up in surprise and I said, Sure, I'd be happy to give you a lift. After yesterday, I hadn't expected her to talk to me, let alone want to ride anywhere together. I told her I'll be leaving in about an hour and a half after my laundry is done and put away. She assured me she'll be ready. She finished preparing something to eat and sat at the table, remaining quiet while Ellie and I continued our conversation. As I stepped out of my cabin later, she emerged from the back door, looking stunning in a turquoise sundress that complemented her red hair. It was clear she wanted me to notice her. Holding the passenger side door open for her, I watched as she slid into the car. We set off, and for the first half of the trip, she sat quietly, observing the countryside. Suddenly, she said, I thought you were going to kiss me yesterday. I glanced at her, but she seemed to be looking out the side window, and I couldn't see her face, so I said, Well, while that may not have been unpleasant, I do have a rule about not forcing unwanted affections upon unreceptive females. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her head spin around, and I could tell she was staring at me. She sat quietly, but I noticed her occasional glances in my direction. We pulled into the general store and we went inside. I needed to grab a couple of new pairs of jeans and shirts while she had a list of things her mother wanted. An hour later, we had everything loaded. I had one more stop to make at the hardware store for a couple of things for Bill, but it was lunchtime and I was hungry. I suggested we stop for a bite to eat, and she agreed. We pulled into the same diner where I had first met Bill and Ellie. We took a table, sitting across from each other, and ordered our food. As we sat in silence, I began to think that perhaps. I should have just gone straight to the hardware store and back to the ranch. Just then, the door swung open and three guys entered. I recognized two of them as the guys who had come calling on Brooke. They made a beeline for our table, with two taking the seats on either side, while the third stood behind me. They ignored me and started talking to her. I stood up and gestured for the third one to take a seat as I moved to the next table. When the waitress brought our food, I motioned her over and had her place my meal in front of me. I ate quickly 
Paying no attention to the conversation at Brooke's table, tossing some bills on the table to cover our meals, I stood up. Brooke had hardly touched her food and her plate was still full. I'm going to run over to the hardware store. I can stop back by here later and see if you're ready to go, I said, intervening in their conversation. She pushed her plate back and stood up and said, It was nice seeing you guys again, but we have to go. The guys at the table tried to protest, with one even offering her a ride home. She declined and followed me out to my SUV. As we drove to the hardware store, she stayed in the vehicle appearing to fume. The silent tension persisted as we drove back to the ranch, turning off the highway onto the mile-long driveway. Why did you do that? She asked. What? I replied, uncertain about what she was pointing out. Moving to the other table. All that. Well, I thought you'd prefer spending time with your friends. Besides, I didn't want to be in the middle of their competition for your attention. You really are in Hayhole, she snapped. Wisely, I kept my mouth shut. I had no desire to fend off her slaps while driving. Pulling up to the main house, she immediately grabbed what she could carry as soon as I opened the rear of the SUV. I picked up more bags and followed her into the house. As I walked in the back door, she dumped everything on the kitchen table without a word to her mother, then strode into the room. Ellie looked at me questioningly. I shrugged, saying, I guess I'm in hayhole. Ellie giggled and walked over, putting a hand on my arm. I have never seen anyone have the effect on Brooke that you seem to have. I guess I was born to just piss her off, I replied. I'm not so sure about that, she said, leaving me confused. I returned to my cabin and stowed away my new clothes. Deciding not to stay cooped up, I went to the barn and saddled a horse. Riding out, I ended up at the top of the waterfall. With the weather being nice, I tied the horse to a tree and sat at the edge of the falls, looking down at the column pool. Sitting there for half an hour, maybe longer. Brooke rode up below me, getting off her horse not wanting to be accused of spying in case she was going skinny dipping again i picked up a stone and tossed it down creating a splash in the water she looked around searching for the source of the noise and spotted me anticipating her departure she instead mounted her horse and rode up to where i was sitting she tied her horse next to mine and walked towards me i stood up taking a few steps away from the edge in case she planned on pushing me off you're in Hayhole, she said, stopping inches from me. And you're still a bee, I said. This time, I didn't wait for her slap. I grabbed her around the waist and kissed her. Quickly releasing her, I tried to move towards my horse, but she seized my arm and turned me back around. I was stunned when she reached behind my neck and pulled me in for another kiss. We found ourselves passionately kissing. As the passion grew, our clothes disappeared, and we had a wonderful time. Gradually, our breathing normalized, and we lingered in each other's embrace. In silence, we dressed, mounted our horses, and rode back down. After stapling our mounts, and without a word, she turned and walked to the main house. In a daze, I returned to my cabin, slipping into the shower. One thing became clear. I harbored much stronger feelings for this captivating woman than I had acknowledged to myself before. I barely had time to dress for supper. Upon entering the kitchen, Bill, Ellie and Kent were already present, but Brooke was nowhere in sight. As we took our seats, she walked in, choosing the chair beside mine instead of her usual place next to Kent. Bill and Ellie exchanged glances, while Brooke merely smiled sweetly in response. During dinner, she chatted lively. Despite her parents' curiosity, they'd refrain from asking why their daughter was in such high spirits. After supper, she assisted her mother in cleaning the kitchen while Kent and I headed back to our cabins. Just as I had settled between the sheets, a soft knock echoed on my door. Wearing only my boxers, I opened the door and Brooke slipped inside, finding her way into my arms. We shared a tender kiss and she guided me back to my bed, joining me after shedding her clothes. Once again, we made love before drifting off to sleep in each other's embrace. The abrupt arrival of 5 a.m. prompted me to groggily reach over and silence the blaring alarm. 
With great effort, I managed to get out of bed. I illuminated the bathroom and dressed for the day, leaving a gentle kiss on her head before slipping out of the cabin. During breakfast, I couldn't ignore the scrutinizing glances from Bill and Ellie. I wondered if they were aware of their daughter's nocturnal whereabouts. Following the meal, I loaded the pickup for another day of setting fence posts. Working alone on a ranch afforded much time for thinking. My thoughts drifted to my recent past, astounded that only three months had passed since leaving my wife. It felt like a lifetime. I thought on the significance of Bill, Ellie and Kent in my life. And then my musings shifted to the beautiful brook and the shared moments from the previous day. I questioned the possibility of finding the kind of love her parents embodied. At lunch, I realized once again that I had forgotten to bring my meal. As the thought crossed my mind, I heard a pickup approaching with speed. Brooke jumped out, running toward me with a bag in hand. She threw herself at me, initiating a passionate kiss before giving me the bag. Disregarding the meal, I pulled her in for another heated kiss. Although I didn't set as many fence posts that day, we had a great time. Amid our moments together, we also found time to talk. On her pressing, I shared the details of my former life, recounting how my ex-wife had betrayed me. The only way I will leave is if you tell me to go, I reassured her. She eventually returned home and I finished my day's work. After showering and changing, she was in the kitchen when I entered once again, choosing the seat next to mine. Midway through our meal, a knock sounded at the front door. Bill answered it and returned with the same guy who had been the first to call on Brooke. The minute he was seated, Brooke looked at him, her expression unreadable. I was wondering if you'd like to go for a drive, he suggested. In this part of the country where options were limited, going for a drive was essentially a euphemism for going on a date. I appreciate the offer, but I don't think my boyfriend would like it, Brooke responded. She leaned over and planted a kiss on my cheek. Mr. Tall and Handsome blushed and stammered before making a hasty exit. With that exchange, our relationship was now out in the open. I glanced at Bill and Ellie, noticing smiles of approval. Even Kent spotted a big grin. We had officially become a couple. In the following days, there were no more visits from local men calling on Brooke. She made it clear that she was not available. I found a way to help her with her plans. She was seeking a loan from the bank to purchase the necessary equipment for her veterinary business. The bank was hesitant to offer an unsecured loan, and the only option was to have her father put the ranch up as collateral. She was reluctant to ask him. I suggested giving me a couple of days. I might have a solution. I contacted my offshore bank, setting up an account under the guise of a fictitious loan company. Brooke filled out a loan application on my computer, which I had set up to route to my email. After waiting a couple of days, I sent her a notice that her loan had been approved and a wire transfer would be made to her account. She was thrilled by the news, but questioned why the loan only carried a 2% annual rate. I explained that they were a non-profit philanthropic group providing loans to those they believe would contribute to the community. While I could have simply offered her the money, I knew she was too proud to accept it. Having earned her degree through hard work, she was determined to succeed on her own terms. By the time her license was approved, she had purchased a new van and transformed into a mobile vet office, complete with necessary medical instruments. Once word spread about her license status, calls for her services came in from local ranchers. Many nights, Brooke spent with me in my cabin. While Bill and Ellie were aware, they seemed to have no objections. At 27, she was old enough to make her own decisions. It took three months for Wilson and his crew to face trial. The case was relatively straightforward. The smallest guy cooperated with the prosecution, receiving two years probation without prison time. The five other hands working for Wilson each got five years in prison. As the mastermind behind the rustling, Wilson received a maximum sentence of 10 years and a $50,000 fine. When he was taken to prison, I initiated an investigation into him and his ranch, discovering that he was single with no family in the area. And with all his hands incarcerated, 
there was no one left to run his ranch. This led me to formulate a new plan. However, before setting it in motion, I needed to address some unfinished business. I had to finalize my divorce from my cheating wife. The thought of Maya getting half my money was not something I could accept. To achieve this, I turned to my friend Jimmy, seeking his loyal assistance once again. Instead of sending an email, I called him and asked him to talk to Maya. I wanted him to convey that I had reached out and wished to propose a settlement in exchange for a divorce. The offer was a straightforward $50,000. If she declined, she would never hear from me again, and she would not receive any money. Initially playing innocent, she demanded to know why I had left and why I wouldn't return. The charade ended when Jimmy revealed that I knew about her affair with Tanner and her intention to divorce me. With her game exposed, Maya, still working as a waitress and struggling financially, accepted my offer. To proceed, I needed to return to Texas and hire a lawyer to draw up the divorce papers. Brooke wasn't thrilled when I informed her of my departure. I explained that I needed to close that chapter of my life and assured her that I would return. Initially planning to leave my vehicle in long-term parking at the airport, she insisted on taking me and being there upon my return. Leaving behind my SUV and most of my belongings, except for what fit in one suitcase seemed to ease her concerns. I departed on a Sunday, and upon my arrival, Jimmy picked me up at the airport. Staying with him and his family, I made sure to call Brooke every night. By Friday, all the paperwork was sorted out. Jimmy took Maya to my lawyer, explaining that she would receive a check for $10,000 immediately, with the remaining 40 paid in 60 days after the divorce was finalized. She signed the papers and my lawyer handed her the $10,000 check. I never had to face the parasite. Then came the realization that I had personal items and storage, keepsakes and heirlooms from my parents, yearbooks and other sentimental belongings. Not wanting to return for them later, I rented a moving van and loaded it up. Brooke was initially taken aback when I revealed I wasn't flying back, but once I explained that I was bringing back everything important to me, her excitement about my return grew. It took me three days of relentless driving to cover the distance. As I pulled into the Rocking Bee Ranch on Tuesday evening, I was greeted with an enthusiastic welcome from everyone. That night, Brooke continued to extend her warm welcome until the early morning, when we finally fell asleep, thoroughly exhausted. With the first part of my plan accomplished, I was now ready to put the rest into action. This involved making several trips to prison, where Wilson was incarcerated. My goal was to persuade him to sell me his ranch. Initially resistant, I continued to present my case. I pointed out that he would be imprisoned for at least seven years, and even with good behavior, he wouldn't be eligible for parole. With no one to tend to his ranch, his house and buildings would likely deteriorate, and his cattle may perish without proper care in the winter. I also raised the question of whether he would be welcomed back after his conviction. Faced with the prospect of ruin, he eventually accepted my offer, providing him with something to start over with upon release. The next step was securing financing. I moved my money back into the country, confident that Maya wouldn't jeopardize her $40,000 by taking any rush actions. I negotiated a price of $5 million with Wilson, which was below the property's true value, making it relatively easy to find financing. I made a down payment of half a million and financed the remaining amount, taking a month to finalize everything. I kept my activities a secret from everyone, except Brooke and Bill. I explained to them that I had personal business related to my assets that needed attention. Although it consumed only one or two days of my time per week, I set up a corporation and registered the land under its name. With summer ending and fall setting in, I hired someone to harvest the hay on the property. Additionally, I employed four hands to work on site and manage the ranch in the interim. The most experienced hand was appointed temporary foreman. I clarified that for a while I would be an absentee owner despite my close proximity. I'd assured him he could always reach me by phone and I planned to visit the ranch frequently. 
The final element of my plan involved remodeling the main house, a two-story, five-bedroom structure in need of modernization. Despite Brooke's frustration with the secrecy surrounding my activities, our relationship continued to thrive. My love for her grew each day, and I sensed that she felt the same way about me. Meanwhile, her veterinary business flourished, requiring her to be on the road frequently, but she remained content and happy. It reached a point where I nearly spilled the beans to her about what I was doing. After returning from checking on the remodeling, she cornered me with questions. What the hell is going on, Tom? Are you seeing someone else? I responded. God, no, I swear there is no one else. I just have some things I need to take care of. Just believe me. I promise I'll tell you everything soon. I'm asking for you to trust me. She scrutinized my face, searching for the truth, and said, Okay, Tom, I do trust you, but you better tell me what's going on soon, or I'm going to kick your ass. As spring arrived and calving season began, the main house renovation was complete. It was time to execute the final part of my plan. One afternoon, when I had Brooke alone, I asked her to go for a drive. I told her I've been thinking it's time for me to leave the Rocking Bee Ranch. Instantly, her eyes welled up with tears and she said, But you promised you wouldn't leave. I had timed it so, that we were at the entrance to the former Flying Doll Ranch. I turned in and started driving down the private road, and I said I wasn't really planning on going far. She looked around, clearly confused. I'm not sure she'd heard what I said. Then she asked what we were doing on Wilson's land. I delayed my answer until we pulled up to the main house. I told her to come on, that I wanted to show her something. I got out of the truck and went around to open her door. Taking her hand, I let her up to the front door and opened it. She asked again what the hell I was doing, that we could get in trouble for this. I told her to relax, that Wilson doesn't own the ranch anymore, and that we should have a look around, that I wanted to know what she thinks of the house. I took her upstairs and we walked through the bedrooms and then back downstairs. There was a large living room, a nicely panelled den, two rooms set up as home offices, and finally the kitchen. I could tell by her face that she loved the new kitchen. There was only one room with furnishings, and that was the one I intended to use for my office. The rest of the house awaited her decisions on how she wanted to furnish it. I asked her what she thought of the house, and she said it was really nice. I asked if she thinks she could live there, and she asked what was going on again. I could see she was confused and getting upset. I dropped to one knee and put my hand into my jacket pocket. I told her Wilson no longer owned the ranch, that I do, and I was asking if she could live there as my wife. In a surprising tone, she asked if I owned the house and I nodded. In excitement, she screamed, Yes! I then took the engagement ring out of my pocket and held it up and proposed to her. Her face scrunched up and her eyes were filled with tears. At first, I thought I had made a mistake until she tackled me onto my back and covered my face in kisses. She then presented me her finger so I could put the ring on her. She looked around the house with new eyes running from room to room and examining everything. I patiently waited until she came running back into my arms. The house is beautiful. I love it, she said enthusiastically. I led her across the room to two doors that opened off a hallway. There are two offices, one for you to run your business from and one for me. I led her into the office with the desk and pulled out a large piece of paper. It had a drawing of a property gate, and over it, it said, Double C Ranch. She looked it over and asked what the double C meant. I told her it stands for Tom and Brooke Ranch. She cried and started pulling at my clothes and I joined in. I sat her on top of the desk and christened the office with our love. In fact, in the days to come, we made love in every room of our new home. Once we had recovered and dressed, I told her it was time to go tell her parents. She was so happy that I think she floated out to the truck. We got back a few minutes after six, and Bill, Ellie and Kent were already in the kitchen for supper. We walked in together, and Brooke held up her left hand and squealed, we're getting married. Ellie jumped up and ran over to hug her daughter, while Bill and Kent came and shook my hand and patted me on the back. 
I then got a big hug from my future mother-in-law while Brooke hugged her father and Kent. When things calmed, we all sat down to eat. Brooke waited until everyone was eating. Of course, this means we will be moving, she said as nonchalantly as possible. Bill, Ellie and Kent were looking shocked in unison. She looked at me and urged me to tell them, so I said, Well, Bill, you know how Wilson wanted to combine his ranch with yours. I was thinking it could be a good thing. Bill stood up, looking furious, and said there was no way in hell the flying doll was going to get his ranch. I laughed and told him to calm down, that it is no longer the flying doll, but the double C ranch, and the new owners are sitting at his table right now. In a confused state, he asked what I was talking about. I told him I'd bought out Wilson, and now the ranch belongs to Brooke and me. Double C, Tom and Brooke. Ellie said she got it right away. I said, Bill, I thought if we combined the two ranches, we could run them. We would split the profit 50, 50. He then said, But the Double C ranch is over twice the size of my ranch, and it brings in a lot more profit. I responded, You have done this all your life. I need your help. I would like us to be equal partners. You would be in charge of the operations, and whatever you say goes. Besides, it is part of Brooke's ranch, too. It will be keeping everything in the family. He sat down and looked at Ellie. She nodded her head. He stuck his hand across the table to me, and we shook on it. My God, Tom, this is going to take some getting used to, but I accept your offer. I said, this means we're going to have more hands to oversee, and that means Kent will be the head foreman. And now I get to pull out all those fence posts. I'd worked so hard to set on that side of the property. Everyone laughed at me. Some of that night was a loud and wild celebration. Brooke spent the night in my cabin and wore me out. We were late for breakfast the next morning, but everyone was still in the kitchen when we came in. They were waiting for us to eat. So we could all drive over to the Double C Ranch and Brooke could show off our new house. Everyone was impressed and I saw Ellie stare jealously at the refurbished kitchen. It took Brooke and her mother a month to furnish the house. It was ready to move into on our wedding night. We were married on the Double C Ranch. Bill and his family were respected and well-liked, and ranchers and their families from miles around came to celebrate the day. As Brooke's husband, Bill's son-in-law, and the new owner of the Double C Ranch, I was welcomed into their society. Later that night, we finally got to bed, and we stayed there, and most of the next day. We would still be there, but on our third day of marriage, I took my bride to Fiji for a tropical honeymoon. Our first roundup that year paid off well, and we sent a lot of cattle to market, making a nice profit. A significant portion went to pay off part of the loan, but with Brooke's business, we were making a comfortable living. We even built a nice new house for Kent, and he now has a girlfriend close to his age who lives in town. We may be having another wedding soon. Another year has gone by, and my beautiful wife has just given me the most fantastic news. She's pregnant. We're going to have a baby. One final word before I go. I know there are those who will say I should have learned my lesson the first time and had Brooke sign a prenuptial agreement. If so, then you really haven't gotten to know my Brooke. She isn't Maya. She works hard at her job and takes care of our home. She is her mother's daughter and she shares her love with me every day, with me and only me. Every day that I look into her blue Irish eyes, I see that love. This brings us to the conclusion of this story, something different than what we usually cover on this channel. How did you experience this episode? I reckon many will think OP didn't learn from his mistake, yet many will cut him some slack and trust his judgment. Now, I'm honestly curious to what you think. Let us know down below. I always like to read the deep conversations in the comment section. Also, thank you for staying till the end again. I feel blessed with an audience like you. You all never fail to brighten up my day and your involvement with this channel makes it so that I keep enjoying to create these episodes for you. Without you, 
there wouldn't be a royal AI. Before you go, read the 329 pages of the like button's terms and conditions, but click disagree. If you have a good story you're willing to share, email it to contactroyalai at gmail.com. See you in the next one.